So welcome back to our AP Chemistry Chapter 14 Kinetics Notes. We are finally at the last topic we're going to discuss for this chapter, Reaction Mechanisms. Reaction Mechanisms is a very difficult topic, not because of what's involved, but because we really don't know much about reaction mechanisms. You could literally spend a lifetime trying to determine a mechanism for a particular reaction. It could be incredibly difficult. So rest assured, you're only expected to know some basic information about reaction mechanisms when it comes to what you would be expected to do on the test. So with reaction mechanisms, we're going to be describing what actually occurs when the reactants collide into each other. Um, and if they have enough energy to do a reaction, what would that look like? So this is collision theory, and I've been mentioning it all along. We know that not every collision guarantees a reaction. They will have kinetic energies, and they need enough kinetic energy for reaction. But here's something new that I want you to consider for this section is the orientation. Okay. Not only do they have to have enough energy to react, we call that activation energy, they need to hit in the right spots in order to make that reaction occur. So it is very possible that two reactants hit each other and don't react for many reasons. Either they don't have enough energy or they hit the wrong areas of each other um, as another reason. So let's consider carbon dioxide. The shape of this molecule is this. Okay. Now statistically speaking, what is the likelihood that we would have three atoms collide to form carbon dioxide? Furthermore, how would they need to collide? Could I collide two oxygens and then a carbon? Obviously not. The, it would have to be that the carbon is zooming around and somehow two oxygens at the same time, if that's what we're going with, would have to collide to hit carbon and make carbon dioxide and have enough energy to form double bonds and all that good stuff. So is that likely is our question. And the answer is no, that's probably not likely. And we've already mentioned how a catalyst could help form an intermediate in order to make that happen. This intermediate or transition state is what we get in between the reactants and the products. So for this reaction where sulfur and iron selenide become selenium and iron sulfide, if we write it out kind of Lewis diagram style, you can see how sulfur has got to hit the iron side of iron selenide, form a bond there with iron, break the bond here with selenium, and then form this. So writing it out this way like we normally would does not necessarily give you a clear indication of what should be going on in that reaction. So you can see we have our reactants, we have our transition state, and then we have our products. And it is exactly that transition state that is at the top of our energy diagrams. If we don't have enough energy to get there, then that transition state won't form, and therefore our reaction won't proceed. So what orientations would not work is my question for you. Okay, well we know the, the sulfur has to hit the iron, so if the sulfur came in and hit the selenium side of iron sulfide, we know that would not work. Okay, there would be no reaction in that case. The other question is, what if sulfur was aiming at iron but at the side? Would that happen? Well, we have to consider the amount of space that these atoms would take up, and we'd have to look at that. And does sulfur have enough room to come in at the side, or would it be repelled by the selenium more than it's attracted to the iron sort of thing? So there's actually lots of, there's probably like a sweet spot here where if it hit the iron there, it would react if it has enough energy. And like all the rest of this area is a no-go zone. Okay, so it is very unlikely that they're going to hit and every single reaction is going to react, which is why we can study kinetics in the first place. 
if everything had the right orientation and energy to react, there'd be no reactions left to do in the world today, which would mean life as we know it would not exist. Now let's consider something a little more challenging. Okay, why is it more challenging? Well, it's more challenging in the kinetic sense. Check this out. Iodide ion attacking a CH3Cl, so it's kind of like methane, but with the Cl instead of a H there, and then the iodine attaches to the C and removes the Cl. So here's what it would look like before the collision. Here's the transition state, and here's after the collision. And this is like mostly guesswork based on the evidence that we might be able to find for it. Um, in the end, we, it's a puzzle. Scientists say, okay, this amount of data kind of points to the fact that the iodine must hit here on the carbon and then form a bond, and then eventually those hydrogens flip over and knock the chlorine out. So what orientations would not work? Well, if the only place I can hit is that carbon, hitting from any other spot around is so not going to work. So we would expect this to slow down the reaction quite a bit. Um, would this be more or less likely to occur than the first equation? Well, what is our the size of our OK zone versus our no-go zone, um, probably a lot smaller. There seems to be a lot more that it could hit, a lot more in the way, a lot more steric hindrance for this reaction than in our first reaction. In our first reaction where it was this atom and going for this compound, there is probably a lot bigger zone it could hit, maybe even as far as like that kind of a zone to hit and still react. So we would expect the rate of this reaction to be slower than the rate of that reaction. How could we be certain? Well, we would need experimental data. Okay, now the examples I just gave you are considered simple because they involve only one step, and they involve only one step between two particles. Most reactions in life are multi-step. So I want you to catch some vocabulary here. When we have a lot of steps, in an entire reaction. You know, it does this, then it does this, then it does this, and then finally it makes the product. We call those individual steps the elementary steps, or the elementary reactions, as in elementary school, basic, bottom level. They are simple steps. And then if you add them all up, you get the entire reaction mechanism. Now we have the saying that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Well in kinetics our saying is that a reaction mechanism is only as fast as the slowest elementary step. So knowing which step of maybe the three or four steps is going to be the slowest is key to knowing the speed of the overall reaction. So we call that the rate determining step and I've also seen it referred to as the rate limiting step. So be aware of that vocabulary. Several elementary steps make up a reaction mechanism. The overall rate of the reaction mechanism will match the rate determining step or the rate limiting step. You can't go faster than that slowest step. They might even not even say these words, right? They might just say this step is slow and these other steps are fast. They, they could totally say it that way. Okay. So the reaction order is equal to the coefficients of the rate determining step. Did you catch how that just changed? All chapter long I've been saying the coefficients in the overall balanced equation do not tell you anything about the order and now I'm saying coefficients and order in the same sentence. Please catch this carefully. The order is equal to the coefficients of the rate determining elementary step. I did not say overall balanced equation. I said of the individual rate determining elementary step. So if my rate is this, then I don't know what the overall equation coefficients would be, but I know of the rate determining step, the slow step, that x and that x match. And that y and that y match. So this can help us determine a mechanism by giving a guide to the rate determining step. So let's consider this reaction that I have in pink here. Okay. 
we do experimentation like we've done before and you can see that we've got our rate is equal to and we've got our rate law or our um, what was the other word for that we've got a rate law anyway and um, oh rate law expression there we go we've got a rate for it and that's what we determined now check it out NO2 I'm sorry NO2 is right there okay in our overall equation and we see that it's second order that means our rate determining step has to have this reactant and has to have a coefficient of two that leads us to probably think our slow step looks like that so now it's a puzzle it is known to us what the overall equation is it is known to us what the rate determining slow step is the question is what can I add to the slow step to get to the overall equation and by just some kind of process of elimination we come up with this that I have here in white that the N2O4 then reacts with CO and forms NO and CO2 and NO2 how did I get that guess and check it was guesswork okay but it does lead me to the point of these are not easy so most of the time you'll be given a mechanism and asked to analyze it as opposed to asked to just create one because that as I've said before could actually literally take a lifetime of study to do now N2O4 is an intermediate so what's characteristic of an intermediate I've said that word before let's be sure we are very clear on the definition of an intermediate did you figure it out okay so an intermediate of N2O4 is a product in an early reaction and is a reactant in a later reaction and it cancels so that you do not see it in the overall balanced equation so that is the characteristic of a reaction intermediate now let me contrast what was the characteristics of a catalyst well a catalyst was the opposite it was a reactant early and it was a product later but it still canceled so you have to be very careful because they are very particular about this on the AP test they very particularly want to know do you understand the difference between an intermediate and a catalyst because they both cancel in the overall equation it's important to note whether it's product first and then reactant then it's an intermediate or if it's reactant first then it's product so be sure that you do that okay so let's give another one of these things a try see how we do so we have the same reaction overall and we do this reaction and I have this that 2NO2 yields something but we do some careful study and we don't find N2O4 what we do find is NO3 okay so how is that going to change things well first off if I'm finding NO3 what do I have then to continue this reaction well with the two NO2s and the NO3 there which is not nitrate by the way there's no charge on it um, I'm lacking a nitrogen and I'm lacking an oxygen do you see how I've come up with that so now I compare this to my overall equation and I say oh look I have two NO2s but I want only one NO2 so I'm gonna need something that cancels that one of those NO2s and I have CO2 but I don't have a CO2 yet or sorry CO carbon monoxide so I'm gonna add a carbon monoxide and on the product side I need an NO hey I have an NO and on the product side I need a CO2 and I don't have a CO2 yet but I also have an NO3 going on and I don't want an NO3 in my overall equation it's not there anywhere so I need it on the reactant side there to cancel so let's double check that we have worked this out intermediates cancel 
N1 of those NO2s cancel. What do we have? NO2 plus CO yield NO plus CO2. And you can see, yes, we did get our overall balanced equation. So I'm probably correct if this reaction has NO3, if we discover that in lab, then there we go, and if it happens in only two steps. If any of those ifs are not true, then it's back to the drawing board. And so it really is difficult to figure out a reaction mechanism. It is a guess and check method and to get proof or at least enough evidence to assume with reasonability that it, the reaction would work this way. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of lab time. So what they're more likely to ask of you is take a reaction mechanism they're offering and evaluate it. A good mechanism does two things. A good mechanism has the I want to switch colors real fast. Has the rate law match the coefficients of the rate determining step and it adds up to match the overall balanced equation. So let's evaluate this mechanism. This is more likely what they're going to ask you on the test. Let's evaluate this mechanism based on this information up here. So easy part first. This added up, they've even done it for me. I have two NOs matching two NOs. I've got BR2 matching BR2. I've got two NOBRs matching two NOBRs. So yes, that part works. Now, the question is, does my slow step match the rate determining step? Huh, well, my rate determining step says I should have two NOs added to one BR2. And what do I have here? I have, well, actually look at this. I have two NOs and one BR2. So it does match, but you're like, it doesn't seem right. Well, what it doesn't seem right is the fact that we have to put our rate law in terms of the overall balanced equations reactants. Yet that doesn't have to be the reactants we have in our rate step. Does this sound complicated? Yeah, it could be. I've got some examples sh coming up, but here's what we do. Instead of this NOBR2 here, we substitute this NOBR here. So in other words, this plus that yields that. And now you can see, oh yes, I most definitely have two NOs and one BR2. Now that was simple substitution. It doesn't always have to be that simple, but that is something you should be able to do. It is if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C kind of substitution for math. We'll practice that a little. Again, what do they really want to know when you analyze a mechanism? Do the reactions add up to give you the overall equation you want? And does the coefficients of the rate determining step match the rate law? Okay, so our rate determining step was this. Our rate law was that. How do those match? And I, I tried to show this. I'm going to write this out again. Okay. Our rate right now is that K equals NOBR2 times NO. But NOBR2 is not in my balanced equation anywhere, and I have to use only reactants in my balanced equation. So what does NOBR2 equal? Well, if you think of the arrow as an equal sign, NOBR2, sorry, that's rate, equals K. NOBR2 equals NO and BR2. I got this much substituting from equation number one in that mechanism. Now this NO is still hanging around and now I group my like terms. So I've got K NO squared BR. Square brackets meaning concentration of. Oh, BR2. Sorry. So there we go. So it does match. You just have to do some math. Now how could a catalyst be involved? Well, a catalyst would never appear in your rate law. It speeds up the K, it changes the K, 
but it would never appear in your rate law, just like an intermediate shouldn't, this was an intermediate, should not appear in your rate law. Could a catalyst be involved by becoming part of an intermediate to facilitate the reaction? Absolutely, it could be. But beyond long years of studying it in lab, we really would not know. All right, so that is it for reaction mechanisms. Again, I want to make this point clear. Okay, let me get rid of this ink. Okay, what makes for a good reaction mechanism as far as we can tell without years and years and years of study in, in lab? Your overall balanced equation is what you get when you add them up, when you add up all and cancel out what cancels. Okay, and the coefficients in your rate law will match the sorry, the orders of your rate law will match the coefficients in your rate determining step, your slow step, your rate limiting step. Again, we might need to do some substitution. If A equals B, and here's B, then we can plug in A for B. Okay, you might need to do some substitution to make it match, but if substituting makes it match, then on those two criteria, you have a good mechanism. Overall equation, check coefficients match the order, check. So that's what makes for a good reaction mechanism. Now, why is this better than one step? Well, here we have only two things needing to collide. Here we have only two things needing to collide. If I did it this way, like the overall equation would suggest, I would need three things to collide. And a two collision process seems more likely to happen than a three collision process. It is that simple. So there we go. Uh, that's reaction mechanisms. That's as much as we can get into it without as significant more time development in the laboratory. And that is just not within our scope this year. So I'm certainly saying this could be a fun thing for you to do in college as you get, you know, master's degrees and PhDs, and it is great things to know. Uh, but this is all we're going to need. Now, again, I also warn you. Sorry, wrong way. Know the subtle difference between a reaction intermediate, that is it's a product and then a reactant, and a catalyst, which is gonna be a reactant and then a product. They both cancel, know that difference. So you should know the difference between intermediates and catalysts, and you should know the two qualities of a good, over, a good mechanism overall. Okay. So that's all I have for you. Of course, we need lots of practice on this, so we're going to do that. Good luck.